The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn by Mark Twain Chapter 6 Well, pretty soon the old man was up and around again, and then he went for Judge Thatcher in the courts to make him give up that money, and he went for me, too, for not stopping school. He catched me a couple of times and thrashed me, but I went to school just the same, and dodged him or outrun him most of the time. I didn't want to go to school much before, but I reckon I'd go now to spite Pap. That law trial was a slow business. Appeared like they weren't ever going to get started on it, so every now and then I borrowed two or three dollars off of the judge for him to keep from getting a cow hiding. Every time he got money he got drunk, and every time he got drunk he raised Cain around town, and every time he raised Cain he got jailed. He was just suited. This kind of thing was right in his line. He got the hanging round the widows too much, and so she told him at last that if he didn't quit using around there she would make trouble for him. Well, wasn't he mad? He said he would show who was Huck Finn's boss. So he watched out for me one day in the spring, and catched me, and took me up the river about three mile in a skiff crossed over to Illinois shore where it was woody, and there weren't no houses, but an old log hut, in a place where the timber was so thick you couldn't find it if you didn't know where it was. He kept me with him all the time, and I never got a chance to run off. He lived in that old cabin, and he always locked the door and put the key under his head nights. He had a gun which he had stole, I reckon, and we fished and hunted, and that was what we lived on. Every little while he locked me in and went down to the store, three miles, to the ferry, and traded fish and game for whiskey, and fetched it home and got drunk and had a good time, and licked me. The widow she found out where I was by and by, and she sent a man over to try to get hold of me, but Pap drove him off with a gun, and it weren't long after that till I was used to being where I was, and liked it, all but the cowhide part. It was kind of lazy and jolly, laying off comfortable all day, smoking and fishing, and no books nor study. Two months or more run along, and my clothes got to be all rags and dirt, and I didn't see how I'd ever got to like it so well at the widow's, where you had to wash, and eat on a plate, and comb up, and go to bed and get up regular, and be forever bothering over a book and have old Miss Watson pecking at you all the time. I didn't want to go back no more. I had stopped cussing, because the widow didn't like it, but now I took to it again, because Pap had no objections. It was pretty good times up in the woods there, take it all around. But by and by Pap got too handy with his hickory, and I couldn't stand it. I was all over welts. He got to going away so much, too, and locking me in. Once he locked me in and was gone three days. It was dreadful lonesome. I judged he had got drowned, and I wasn't ever going to get out any more. I was scared. I made up my mind I would fix up some way to leave there. I had tried to get out of that cabin many a time, but I couldn't find no way. There weren't a window to it big enough for a dog to get through. I couldn't get up the chimbley. It was too narrow. The door was thick, solid oak slabs. Pap was pretty careful not to leave a knife or anything in the cabin when he was away. I reckon I'd hunted the place over as much as a hundred times. Well, I was most all the time at it, because it was about the only thing to put in the time. But this time I found something at last. I found an old rusty wood saw without any handle. It was laid in between a rafter and the clapboards of the roof. I greased it up and went to work. There was an old horse blanket nailed against the logs at the far end of the cabin, behind the table, to keep the wind from blowing through the chinks and putting the candle out. I got under the table and raised the blanket, and went to work to saw a section of the big bottom log out, big enough to let me through. Well, it was a good long job but I was getting towards the end of it when I heard Pap's gun in the woods. I got rid of the signs of my work, 
and dropped the blanket and hid my saw, and pretty soon Pap come in. Pap warn't in a good humor, so he was his natural self. He said he was downtown, and everything was going wrong. His lawyer said he reckoned he would win his lawsuit and get the money if they ever got started up on the trial, but then there was ways to put it off a long time, and Judge Thatcher knowed how to do it. And he said people allowed there'd be another trial to get me away from him, and give me to the widow for my guardian, and they guessed it would win this time. This shook me up considerable, because I didn't want to go back to the widow's any more, and be so cramped up and civilized, as they called it. Then the old man got to cussin', and cussed everything and everybody he could think of, and then cussed them all over again to make sure he hadn't skipped any, and after that he polished off with a kind of general cuss all round, including a considerable parcel of people which he didn't know the names of, and so called them what's-his-name when he got to them, and went right along with his cussin'. He said he would like to see the widow get me. He said he would watch out, and if they tried to come any such game on him he knowed of a place six or seven mile off to stow me in, where they might hunt till they dropped, and they couldn't find me. That made me pretty uneasy again, but only for a minute. I reckoned I wouldn't stay on hand till he got that chance. The old man made me go to the skiff and fetch the things he had got. There was a fifty-pound sack of cornmeal, and a side of bacon, ammunition, and a four-gallon jug of whiskey, and an old book and two newspapers for wadding besides some towel. I towed it up a load, and went back and sat down in the bow of the skiff to rest. I thought it all over, and I reckoned I would walk off with a gun and some lines, and take to the woods when I run away. I guessed I wouldn't stay in one place, but just tramp right across the country, mostly night times, and hunt and fish to keep alive, and so get so far away that the old man nor the widow couldn't ever find me any more. I judged I would saw out and leave that night if Pap got drunk enough, and I reckoned he would. I got so full of it I didn't notice how long I was staying till the old man hollered and asked me whether I was asleep or drowned. I got the things all up to the cabin, and then it was about dark. While I was cooking supper, the old man took a swig or two and got sort of warmed up, and went to ripping again. He had been drunk over in town, and laid in the gutter all night, and he was a sight to look at. The body would have thought he was at him, he was just all mud. Whenever his liquor begun to work, he most always went for the government, and this time he says, Call this a government? Why, just look at it and see what it's like. Here's the law a standin' ready to take a man's son away from him, a man's own son, which he has had all the trouble and all the anxiety and all the expense of raisin'. Yes, just as that man has got that son raised at last, and ready to go to work and begin to do something for him and give him a rest, the law up and goes for him. And they call that government. That ain't all, nother. The law backs that old Judge Thatcher up and helps him to keep me out of my property. Here's what the law does. The law takes a man worth six thousand dollars and upwards and jams him into an old trap of a cabin like this and lets him go round in clothes that ain't fitting for a hog. They call that government. A man can't get his rights in a government like this. Sometimes I got a mighty notion to just leave the country for good and all. Yes, and I told him so. I told old Thatcher so to his face. Lots of em heard me, and can tell what I said. Says I, for two cents I'd leave the blame country and never come anear it again. Them's the very words. I says, look at my hat, if you call it a hat, but the lid raises up, and the rest of it goes down till it's below my chin, and then it ain't rightly a hat at all, but more like my head was shoved up through a joint of stove-pipe. Look at it, says I, such a hat for me to wear, one of the wealthiest men in this town if I could get my rights. Oh, yes, this is a wonderful government, wonderful. 
Why, looky here. There was a free nigger there from Ohio, a mulatter, most as white as a white man. He had the whitest shirt on you ever see, too, and the shiniest hat and there ain't a man in that town that's got as fine clothes as what he had, and he had a gold watch and chain, and a silver-headed cane, the awfulest old gray-headed nabob in the state. And what do you think? They said he was a professor in a college, and could talk all kinds of languages, and knowed everything. And that ain't the worst. They said he could vote when he was at home. Well, that let me out. Thinks I, what is the country a coming to? It was election day, and I was just about to go and vote myself if I warn't too drunk to get there, but when they told me there was a state in this country where they'd let that nigger vote, I drawed out. I says I'll never vote again. Them's the very words I said. They all heard me, and the country may rot for all me. I'll never vote again as long as I live. And to see the cool way of that nigger? Why, he wouldn't a give me the road if I hadn't shoved him out of the way. I says to the people, why ain't this nigger put up at auction and sold? That's what I want to know. And what do you reckon they said? Why, they said he couldn't be sold till he'd been in the state six months, and he hadn't been there that long yet. There now, that's a specimen. They call that a government that can't sell a free nigger till he's been in the state six months. Here's a government that calls itself a government, and lets on to be a government, and thinks it is a government, and yet's got to sit stock still for six whole months before it can take hold of a prowling, thieving, infernal, white-shirted, free nigger, and— Pap was a-going on, so he never noticed where his old limber legs was taking him to. So he went head over heels over the tub of salt pork and barked both shins, and the rest of his speech was all the hottest kind of language. Mostly hove at the nigger and the government, though he gave the tub some, too, all along, here and there. He hopped around the cabin considerable, first on one leg and then on the other, holding first one shin and then the other and at last he let out with his left foot all of a sudden, and fetched the tub a rattling kick. But it warn't good judgment, because that was the boot that had a couple of his toes leaking out the front end of it, so now he raised a howl that fairly made a body's hair raise, and down he went in the dirt, and rolled there, and held his toes, and the cussin' he'd done then laid over anything he had never done previous. He said so his own self afterwards. He had heard old Salbury Hagen in his best days, and he said it laid over him, too, but I reckon that was sort of piling it on, maybe. After supper, Pap took the jug, and said he had enough whiskey there for two drunks and one delirium tremens. That was always his word. I judged he would be blind drunk in about an hour, and then I would steal the key, or saw myself out one or the other. He drank and drank, and tumbled down on his blankets by and by. But luck didn't run my way. He didn't go sound asleep, but was uneasy. He groaned and moaned and thrashed about this way and that for a long time. At last I got so sleepy I couldn't keep my eyes open all I could do, and so before I knowed what I was about I was sound asleep, and the candle burning. I don't know how long I was asleep. But all of a sudden there was an awful scream, and I was up. There was Pap looking wild, and skipping about every which way, and yelling about snakes. He said they was crawling up his legs, and then he would give a jump and scream, and say one had bit him on the cheek. But I couldn't see no snakes. He started and run around and round the cabin, hollering, "'Take him off! Take him off! He's biting me on the neck!' I never see a man look so wild in the eyes. Pretty soon he was all fagged out, and fell down panting. Then he rolled over and over wonderful fast, kicking things every which way, and striking and grabbing at the air with his hands, and screaming and saying there was devils a hold of him. He wore out by and by, and laid still a while, moaning. Then he laid stiller, and didn't make a sound. 
I could hear the owls and the wolves away off in the woods, and it seemed terrible still. He was laying over by the corner. By and by he raised up part way and listened, with his head to one side. He says, very low, Tramp, 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 that's the dead. Tramp, 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 they're coming after me, but I won't go. Oh, they're here. Don't touch me. Don't. Hands off. They're cold. Let go. Oh, let a poor devil alone. Then he went down on all fours, and crawled off, begging them to let him alone, and he rolled himself up in his blanket, and wallowed in under the old pine table, still a-begging, and then he went to crying. I could hear him through the blanket. By and by he rolled out and jumped up on his feet looking wild, and he see me and went for me. He chased me round and round the place with a clasp-knife, calling me the Angel of Death, and saying he would kill me, and then I couldn't come for him no more. I begged, and told him I was only Huck, but he laughed such a screechy laugh, and roared and cussed and kept on chasing me up. Once when I turned short and dodged under his arm, he made a grab and got me by the jacket between my shoulders, and I thought I was gone. But I slid out of the jacket quick as lightning and saved myself. Pretty soon he was all tired out, and dropped down with his back against the door, and said he would rest a minute and then kill me. He put his knife under him, and said he would sleep and get strong, and then he would see who was who. So he dozed off pretty soon. By and by I got the old split-bottom chair, and clum up as easy as I could, not to make any noise, and got down the gun. I slipped the ramrod down it to make sure it was loaded. Then I laid it across the turnip barrel, pointing towards Pap, and sat down behind it to wait for him to stir. And how slow and still the time did drag along. End of chapter.